All right, welcome back to Dear Baseball Gods. This is episode 44. Get my mic adjusted here. And uh, in today's episode, we're going to cover three big topics. Number one, dealing with slumps, and that could be not just uh, individual performance, but team performance, uh, the mental side of pitching, and what parents should expect from different age players. So this has been a, a good theme because I'll give you the backstory. So my team... I am coaching 14U, and if you don't know, I own an academy with uh, six teams. We have an organization called the Warbird Senators, and my 14U team is extremely talented, like top to bottom, very good ball players for their age, very physical. We have hard throwers. I mean, we match up extremely well on paper, and we went 4-0 and to start our season against some okay teams. Um but it, to me, it proved like, yeah, we are a very strong team. Since then, <laughs> we've been 10 run ruled three times and lost a game that was just like a baseball game. We lost 4-2 to two where neither team really hit, and we just came, on, came out on the wrong side of it. So it's been interesting uh, underperforming for the first time as a head coach because last year I roved and I was not a head coach. So I would just travel to each of our different six teams kind of as like the – you I just I guess like the roving coach or like the coordinator or whatever. So I get to know all the players in the organization and I get to know the coaches. I just get a, a pulse for everything that's going on. That's was sort of my role as sort of overseer of our organization. So this year I'm a head coach, which I really enjoyed, but uh, just figuring out a lot of stuff as we go, like what does a 14 year old know? What does a 16 year old know? Like what do you, you take a lot of stuff for granted. And I was having a conversation with someone recently about, uh, you know, Major League Baseball, and I'm like, think about it. Every ground ball that doesn't leave the infield basically becomes an out, like almost every single one, right? In the big leagues, every team field's 980 or better, which includes all chances, you know, pop-ups, throws to first is, you know, part of that equation, all that stuff. But uh, they, like, literally every ball that's hit becomes an out if it's not a hit, obviously. But in amateur baseball, obviously, that's not true, and uh, at low levels of baseball pop-ups fall in the infield you know range going back on pop-ups is greatly decreased there's so many different things so uh my team has had a, a little rough patch which in in which we just played well below our abilities and it's uh it's been confusing to say the least so we're going to talk about that today uh, and then after that we're going to go into the sort of mental side of pitching because pitchers are not uh, pitching machines. They often don't throw strikes or they struggle a lot of times not because of mechanics. And I think that's a tough thing for people to understand that they can sometimes lack perspective on if they didn't play. Uh, and then lastly, what should a parent expect from a certain age kid? I'm still figuring this out a little bit myself, but we're going to talk through it a little bit. All right. So that's what you can look forward to today here on episode 44. All right. Topic one, let's talk about dealing with slumps. So slumps are a cause for panic in almost everyone where, oh no, little Johnny's open the season. Oh, for 11, he needs a hitting lesson. He needs a pitching lesson. You know, he got shelled. He didn't throw strikes, all this stuff. Everything is a source of panic for parents, coaches, and players alike. And the first thing to know is number one, that baseball is a lot of random chance Baseball takes a lot of breaking in, and baseball is often a very streaky sport. So just like if you were to flip a coin, you know, U.S. quarter could be a, or we could do like a Buffalo head nickel, could be a Sacagawea dollar. Those things are super unsuccessful. Whatever you flip a coin, over time you flip that coin ten thousand times, you're probably going to get five thousand heads and five thousand tails, plus or minus a very small amount, right? Because it's a fair coin it's going to average out over time. However, if you're to flip that Sacagawea dollar just 10 times in a row, you might get nine heads and one tails. It doesn't mean the coin's rigged. It doesn't mean anything's wrong with it. It doesn't mean that it's not a fair coin. It just means that that sample size was small enough to not be indicative of the true odds at stake. So with baseball, number one, you could go up to bat 10 times, hit two line drives. They both get caught, hit them right at a fielder. Uh, you could hit a pretty deep fly ball, also gets caught. You could hit a hard ground out with a run on first, and they get the out at second. 
that is a fielder's choice that maybe that ball when he has to throw across a diamond, maybe you beat it out or whatever. There's just so many different scenarios in which we can kind of get screwed out of a good result, right? Baseball has a lot of chance. And uh, as a player, when you focus on the negative stuff, so when you focus as a pitcher, like, oh, that blooper fell in, that was that was BS, blah, 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 blah. Lots of players, even at extremely high levels, don't seem to understand that for every blooper that falls in, they get a line drive hit right at a guy. Like, we get, it pretty much evens out over time. Certainly, when things are not going well, you highlight the bad stuff, and it's easy to ruminate on that. However, when you really think about it, I've had, like I said, I've had as many line drives go right into mitts or like 2-0, guy hits an absolute missile one hopper right at my shortstop who flips the second, who flips the first, and we get out of the inning. Like sometimes like the inning is just boiling up and you're like, oh God, I have the bases loaded and one out or I'm walking everyone, I can't throw a strike and things are going to get out of control and then suddenly you just throw a pitch right down the middle and you're like, Ugh, and then he pops it up or he hits, a, like I said, that one hopper right at the shortstop and you get a double play baseball isn't like a movie where the suspense just builds and then, you know, I don't know, the thing happens. But a lot of times it just suspense builds and then it just immediately dissipates because of luck and vice versa. Sometimes things are going great. And then sometimes, man, you get two quick outs and then blooper falls in. You hit a guy with a pitch that was like kind of just slipped out of your hand. And then a 19 hop ground ball sneaks through the hole and then guy hits a double and suddenly three runs came in. You're like, how did that just happen? Like it goes on both sides. So number one, we need to know what the sample size is and if we actually need a panic. So if your kid goes 0 for 15 to start the season, that's not great, you know, and maybe there's a big problem, but maybe there isn't. So when I played uh, independent baseball, I was in the Frontier League my first couple years and lots of younger players and lots of players were trying to get into that league. It was a very rookie heavy league. So there's lots of turnover. So basically, if you get a chance and you have a bad couple weeks, they get rid of you because there's no track record that you're good, right? There's maybe you're just out of college and you're playing pro ball for the first time and it just seems like you can't hack it, right? You hit 150 over your first 30 at bats and that's that for you. And that's the end of your career, maybe. It's very cutthroat. However, at the higher levels, so I played in the Atlantic League my last three years, it was very different because they're getting guys who had long track records. So most guys had eight years or more of professional experience. And because they played that long, they usually played at double A, triple A or the majors. And you get one of those guys. So they go, okay, we signed a, we signed a relief pitcher who played his last two seasons at triple A and then got let go. They don't cut that guy in spring training because he had a bad couple outings. They don't cut that guy in the first month even because he starts off slow. Maybe he gets hit around a little bit. They know that he's been a proven performer, and they let those guys get slow starts. You know, one of my teammates, um, an excellent hitter named Dan Lyons, he was like 280, 290, 290 for like three consecutive years. And then when I joined their team and he and I were teammates, he started off really slow that year. I think he was hitting like 230, maybe for a while, 240. And like, what's wrong? And nothing was wrong. He ended up hitting like the same as he always hit later on. He just started a little cold and then got pretty hot and then it averaged out. So they didn't panic with him because they knew they knew that, okay, you know, whether it's the first month or the last month, there's going to be this up and down wave period. But when people start out at a really steep down, they freak out and they think that something's broken. They start trying to invent new pitches. They start trying to reinvent their swing. They need 15 pitching lessons. And it's just really not that way. And I mean, the reality is that we will have ups and downs, but the, but it gets scary when you're really down to start because we think that you just like, can't do it. But we have to have perspective and the questions we have to ask. So back to the example with uh, with my team. My team started off 4-0. and We're now 4-4. and We've lost the last three games in sort of horrendous fashion, like 9 to nothing, 8 to nothing, 12-1. It's been strange playing like super far below our ability. And I coach a 14 u team that has very high ability for their age. So as we lost again last night, I just was wondering the whole game, I'm like, what, what are we missing? Our pregame is fine. We hit, we throw, we take a bunch of fly balls, pop-ups, even ground balls. You know, we're relaxed. Uh, our practices, we get a lot accomplished. Our kids have a a workload sheet where they have to play catch and get their flat rounds in. We get bullpens twice a week or at least once a week. 
uh, in addition to their you know pitching in games. Um, I don't think it's a preparation issue. Could I tighten up our practices a little bit? Could I make things a little more efficient at practices? Sure. Could I rework them a little bit? Sure. But is preparation really what we're lacking that suddenly we're going out and getting beat? Not really. Uh, we have a longer pregame than other teams. We have 75 minutes for pregame. So again, we get a lot of swings in. We get a lot of fielding. I mean, we have time and we, we're we ready to take the field, but then we're just not hitting either. And then we make errors in the field, pop-ups drop. Um, it's just been strange. And so when I really consider like what we might do different on the player level, on my level, the coaching level, on the practice level, like pregame, you say like, where is there a hole in our preparation somewhere that we need to fill that this is the reason that we're not playing well? And as I go through the list, like I said, I think there's some definite things that we can do. Uh, maybe some of my philosophies haven't worked out as well as far as some of our pitch selection and stuff like that. But on the whole, there isn't really one. And so the question is, okay, I think we just need to ride this out. And if so, for how long? And uh, when is it going to ride itself? Because if you can't find an obvious reason for something going wrong, then you just have to ride it out. And sometimes it's just bad luck. And sometimes it's just being a baseball player, especially at a lower level where the floodgates just open a lot faster. So at a high level, when you don't pitch well, you don't give up 10 runs. You have like four or five, and then they get you out of there, right? The game still became – it stays a lot more manageable. There are certainly 17-1 to 1 games in the major leagues, but they're very infrequent. You know, and blowouts are more like 8-3, to 8-2, to two, where the, the, the outcome is pretty certain early, even though it's not like a crazy, you know, Bugs Bunny kind of uh, gap between winner and loser. So the question is, again, when you're slumping, whether it's as a team or a player, how do you know when you need to change and – how do you know when you just need to ride it out? So I remember in my last couple of seasons, I pitched really poorly in July for both of my 14 and my 2015 season. And I just, for like two weeks, it just like seems like hitters had seen me enough where they caught up to what I was doing. Uh, I feel like I got a little bit of bad luck at times. Um, and then I also made a lot of bad pitches. So I just feel like I there was like a confluence of factors where hitters had seen me a bunch and they kind of knew what to expect from me. So they had a little maybe better at bats than they did early in the season when they were still getting used to what I what I did as a pitcher. And then uh, when you're not executing as well, which I probably wasn't at the time. And then with a little bit of bad luck, you know, some some balls that could have been double play balls go through or bloopers fall or calls don't go your way, whatever. Uh, all those things could snowball at once. You know, hitters are having better bats because they've seen me now. Uh, some of the balls that would have been hits were just by luck, um, or sorry, would have been outs are just now by luck hits. And then maybe I'm not pitching quite as well as I was before. Those three things all add up pretty pretty quickly. And I just, like, didn't get good results. I'd go in, I'd give runs every time. i give hits a lot. And uh, it was just a rough couple of weeks. And so I made little adjustments. I started pitching inside a little bit more. Uh, and I started throwing my off-speed stuff a little bit more, but it was small stuff. But other than that, all the other things, my preparation, I, I just like, I just tried to wait it out really. Cause I knew that what I was doing, everything up until that date where I kind of started getting hit, where I had strung like five or six outings in a row that weren't very good. Everything I'd done up to that date was the same as everything I was doing while I was getting it, while I was slumping. So it wasn't like the preparation was wrong because otherwise I would have been pitching bad the whole season. So my preparation stayed largely the same. Um, I asked catchers, I asked my coaches, I asked other guys like what they thought was maybe like going on. And they're like, well, I think you're just missing over the middle a lot, a lot, you know, compared to you seem like you're hitting your spots a little better earlier. You're making, you're just executing more. Um, so obviously it comes down to playing the game well. Like you have to, if you don't want to slump, you have to hit the ball. You have to pitch the ball well. You have to execute. Ultimately, coaches can't do that for you. Um, and that was one of the things I told my players the other day. It's like, if we're not unprepared, because I asked them, I'm like, do we need to do more in practice? Do we need to do more in pregame? What do we need? What what can I help you with? And what can we help ourselves with? Like, is our pregame missing something? Like, what can we do? What can we add? And they're like, no, like, we feel like we're prepared. Like, I can't catch pop-ups for you. Like, I can't get your mitt down. You know, we can yell at you about it. We can do more work on it in practice. But at the end of the day, when you're out there, you have to perform. So that's part of it too. But 
So anyway, I just wrote it out. I started changing my pitch sequencing just a little bit where I started going inside a little bit more and uh, just focused a little harder on doing my job well and executing and things righted. I don't know. After a couple of weeks, I just became my old self again. So, you know, you can't freak out and suddenly you see a lot of guys, they have a bad outing and you see them the next game in pregame and they're like reworking on their mechanics. Or they're working really hard on their mechanics. I never liked to do that when I was, you know, I knew that if I strung out 30 outings in a row, there's going to be bad ones in there. But if I have five good ones and then one bad one, then five good ones and then one bad one, do I need to remodel myself or change my pregame routine after the bad one? Not really. It's just like, screw it. Like I didn't throw good that time. Big deal. You know, there's a lot of factors and getting obsessed with them is often counterproductive too. So things you can control during a season. Number one, uh, your preparation, you know, your routine. Does your preparation, your routine consistently put you in a place to succeed? Are you throwing enough? Are, is your throwing session focused? Are you throwing enough change-ups, enough curveballs, enough sliders to keep those pitches sharp when you get your chance on the mound? As a hitter, are you taking enough swings? Are you constantly focused on fixing the little flaws in your swing that you're, maybe your hitting coach has worked on uh, with you? Are you always making some little improvements? Are you seeing enough live, you know, higher speed pitching, which is tougher at youth, youth baseball? Um, I mean, it's tougher even in higher levels because you don't see live arms a lot except when you're in a game. Um, but you kind of have to like audit yourself. What are you missing and what are you, what are you getting? Is there a, something that like, oh yeah, my changeup stinks because I really haven't been throwing enough in the bullpen or I haven't been throwing enough in my catch routine or my flat ground routine or whatever. I probably just need to throw more of those. Sometimes you just need to throw more in the game too. You just have to force yourself. That was something with me. Like I, I could, I could get by a lot of times with two pitches. And then when I needed that third one, it wasn't there a lot of times because I didn't throw it enough. And I had to just sort of like, okay, I need to incubate this by mixing in some more of them in games where it makes sense, even though I might go to a curveball at that point, you know, ordinarily. So it's hard to say exactly what we're looking for with all this stuff. It's hard to say exactly how to know when to change, but we have to remember sample size is important. So if it's a couple of bats, if it's a couple outings, if it's a couple innings, you know, and when I say a couple, even like a thousand at bats isn't necessarily indicative in the majors because they get tons of bats, how good you are, or what your platoon split is. So like they can't say if you can't hit lefties yet until you've gotten thousands of at bats off them a lot of times. So they, the, the statisticians, they know, the analysts, they know that there's still so much random variance in baseball that they have to have large sample sizes to really infer what you can and can't do. And uh, in youth baseball, obviously sample sizes are way, way smaller. So you're not going to get a thousand bats to prove your worth. You might only get a couple. You might get a dozen. You might get two or three dozen. But you know, coaches have to analyze, like, how does his swing look? How are his at-bats? Is he hitting the ball hard? It's not just about, you know, your batting average or any of that. But um, we just try to figure out what – is he making good contact? Is he having good at-bats? Is he always putting himself in a hole? What can we do to make sure that we have an idea that you can – that you will start hitting at some point if you're not or that you will start getting outs if you're not right now? You know, for me, it's strike throwing a lot of times. If you're throwing strikes, then we just need to refine those strikes. If you're not throwing strikes, then we need to get you to throw strikes. Um, lots of different factors. But dealing with slumps is tough. It's one of those things that, if anything, I say ride it out a little longer. Look at your preparation. Don't look at remodeling yourself. But really lay out what you're doing in the week and see are you really prepared to put yourself in a position to succeed when you go out to the mound. And if you're not, that's the first thing we need to fix. It's not to fix your mechanics right away. It's not to fix your swing right away. It's to fix all the things that are preparing you to go out there and have good at-bats, you know, take good ground balls in the field, get good roots on fly balls in the outfield, and have, have good innings as a pitcher. Okay, so second thing that I want to cover this week is – mental side of pitching and how it's tough to figure out what's necessarily going on with youth pitchers. So when I say youth pitchers, I mean anywhere between, you know, 10, 8, whatever, where they start all the way up until high school, college, really just amateurs in general. But so mental side is huge because we're not robots. Pitching is not just like, here's your mechanics. Let's learn good mechanics. Therefore, you throw all the strikes you want. You execute pitches, all that stuff. It just doesn't happen quite that easily. And just 
here's a quick test for you. Number one, does your son or the players or the pitcher in your life, when he throws a bullpen, does he throw more strikes than he go, does in a game? Like a significant amount more. Every pitcher, if you throw 80% strikes in the bullpen, you'll throw 70% strikes in a game. If nothing changes mentally, just the competition, the higher speed, everything with the hitter in there, just different. You don't throw as many strikes, obviously, as when you're just practicing. Uh, but for pitchers that can consistently throw strikes in the bullpen, if they don't consistently throw strikes or they be kind of rated as kind of inconsistent or they walk a lot of hitters or they don't just throw that many strikes in a game, then there's something different going on. It's nothing physical because bullpen mechanics, game mechanics, they're the same thing. So when there's a big disconnect from the bullpen to the game, it's really just in their head. And uh, it's it's really tough, I think, for outsiders to understand that. So if you didn't pitch or if you didn't pitch at a really high level or you just haven't been in the game long enough or, you know, maybe you played as a kid, but it's been a long, 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 long time, you sort of lose perspective on the fact that there's just a lot going on out there. And if you think yourself through it too much and if you guide yourself through it too much, it gets very difficult to manage the game. So, you know, I've seen tons and tons of pitchers who they throw consistent strikes in the bullpen. They throw very accurately in the bullpen. And then when they go into the game, you can see them guiding them guiding their body through the delivery. And guiding their body is I'm not just I'm not locking on the mitt and I'm just making my pitch and my body does what I've already programmed it to do. It's I need to hit this outside corner spot. So I'm gonna go through and then get my front shoulder up and then accelerate the ball and then really pull it right here and that's sort of the way they do it consciously. And I know that because I've done that at many different points in my in my life. I was that way as a hitter for the most part in high school. I really couldn't pull the ball. I was in like a middle, like a, a middle away kind of hitter. And my coach in high school uh, was like proud of me for that. He thought that it was, I was like advanced kind of because I could, I had like an opposite field approach. Whereas most young hitters, they like pulling the ball and whatever. It wasn't that way. I always knew that I just like, I didn't react as well as I sort of like told myself to swing. And that was why I didn't pull the ball. And I knew this, I started to figure it out one day because two of my biggest hits in high school, uh, I remember, well, I guess three of them. A, my first varsity at bat, I hit a home run. This was at a short porch field. It was an opposite field home run. But I remember that home run because A, it was my first varsity at bat and I was nervous. But B, because... I didn't tell myself to swing. I just was like so nervous and amped up and in the moment that I just like saw ball hit ball and I just happened to go <laughs> oppo taco like 320. Like it wasn't very far. It was a very short field. And uh, but it was cool and it was different because again, I just automatically reacted to the pitch and that's what happened. And these two other hits in my career, they were both pulled balls like to the left side of the gap, balls I just destroyed that it was the same thing. I don't know what happened. I don't know why. Maybe it was just that it was like a big situation and there are runners on and like a hard throwing pitcher or whatever. But I just got in the box and when I saw the ball, my body swung and I just like tanked it. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I should just do that every time. I should just go up there and just not think and just like let my body do it. But it's weird to try to do that because I was so used to my whole life. Like, all right, here's the pitch. Like, swing and obviously it wasn't like that slow because I would just strike out every time if I told myself like swing but basically on a kind of like micro level I was I was seeing the ball and like telling myself to swing where the best hitters don't do that they just they've seen enough pitches and they just know to react the right way when the ball comes in so I handicap I handicap myself as a, as a hitter like that I I fully aware of it and there's lots of hitters that do that. There's lots of pitchers that do the same thing. And I was always battling that as a, as a pitcher because when you're trying to hit a spot, it's easy to want to control everything and, and like want to really mentally say, I'm going to do these bunch of things to make that ball go to that spot. And when you do that, it actually makes everything worse. It just screws everything up. When you can lock your eyes on the mitt and have such intense focus that you sort of lose track of what everything else is doing. So basically, if I'm like I'm staring through the camera right now to my uh, my back wall, and if I'm staring that hard, I can't really like see what my body's doing. I like kind of know what it's doing, but I 
I allow it to do what it knows how to do rather than I'm my gaze is a little bit lighter and now I can like think my way through my delivery. So thinking is like this, the worst thing ever for, for sports. It's just terrible. And it's extremely difficult to break yourself out of that. And when I struggled, I struggled a lot throwing a breaking ball for strike. I struggled throwing my breaking ball all the way from college into pro ball. When I first learned it, I had this nasty just hammer curveball that I got taught and I just like threw it and I could throw it for a strike all the time because I was just automatic with it. And it was crazy. It was great. And that got me to college. But at some point, I started to lose feel for it. So I started to try to control it. So I was like, okay, if you catch it here, it'll go for a strike. And then it doesn't. And then it's like, okay, well, then I got to catch it here. And then there you have it. I'm trying to like consciously get my finger into the exact right spot position to get that breaking ball to go where I want it to go and it just can't work that way because you just can't repeat it that way uh it's just like too many different signals going through your brain through your body so I know for a fact that that was why I struggled throwing my my off-speed stuff so much for strikes and I did take up a meditation practice and I did a lot of meditation and visualization and that helped tremendously get me reconnected with my mitt and my focus and get my focus there because my, my focus was so much on executing the pitch, visualizing the pitch, that I was so focused there that my body, like, I wasn't looking at my body anymore. It's kind of like if you had two children, they're both both misbehaving, and you're focused on just one of them, the other one can kind of, like, do its thing and continue to, like, break stuff or whatever. Uh, that was kind of how it was. If I got so focused on the mitt and so focused on visualizing the pitch then I didn't have enough brain power left to like think myself through it. It would just sort of happen. And the couple games when I was really struggling with this, when I like wasn't in it, there was one game where I, I, I threw a one hitter one time and I just miraculously threw my curveball for strikes that game in a season when I threw like zero curveballs for strikes. Like this is my rookie year. Like I threw like zero curveballs for strikes that whole season. I basically threw all fastballs, but one game I had, I threw a one hitter, complete game shutout, 14 strikeouts. And for whatever reason, I threw curveballs for strikes that game. I was just like, so out of my mind, like in this trance, just like getting the ball and throwing it that the curveball went along for the ride. I just like got the curveball and threw it and it was fine. But all the other starts that year, I was like, Oh, I got to get this curveball. So I got to get it here and then it'll go for a strike. And I just, it never works. Just never, ever works that way. So if your son is out there struggling to throw strikes and his mechanics look mostly as good as all the other pitchers, that's the other thing with youth baseball, amateur baseball, every pitcher that goes out there, there's some that look bad and there's some that look really good, but yet there's not a super strong correlation between which ones throw strikes. You could have the kids with ugly mechanics that have clearly are from smaller towns or whatever. They don't have as good of instruction, perhaps they still throw strikes. Some of them, like how can a kid with bad mechanics who's never been taught throw strikes kid with really good mechanics throws less strikes. It doesn't make sense, but it's because there's this huge middle component missing because we're not pitching machines. We're not robots. And some kids are just natural strike throwers. And when you have really good mechanics and a really good arm and you're a natural strike thrower, which natural strike thrower just means like that weird mind body connection where you're focused on the mid and you know what your body's doing and you don't screw it up by overthinking it, then you're good. Like your path is clear to continue going, as far as you want in baseball. But if you don't have one of those things, like I didn't, I don't know what I did over time. I think just experience and getting more of that fight when it's like fight or flight, when you start to get nervous, like, oh, it's 2-0. Like, I got to definitely throw a fastball for a strike, and then you guide it even worse. Uh, but guiding the ball and that side, that aspect of the mental side of pitching is just really tough. I mean, it I think guys like me battle it their whole career. I battled it till age 30. And obviously, like, the expectations and what that looks like at age 28, 29, 30 is very different than when you're a kid. Like, I wouldn't go out there and walk five batters, but I wouldn't throw, you know, a 2-1 curveball. Or I, I wouldn't throw it at all, or I would, like, never throw a first strike. And it to the untrained eye, like, maybe you don't see any of that stuff as, like, a real negative. You don't notice the fact that, oh, he can't throw a, he can't throw a curveball when he's behind the count. Or he can't throw a curveball when he's even in the count. Um, I know that and it affects my performance on the field, but to the untrained eye, like that's not like a big thing. So I'm not walking everybody. I'm not changing the whole flow of the game. It's just like, I can't be, I'm going to hit my competency level 
where I can't go up another level because I just can't do that. I can't make that pitch, right? You can't pitch in the big leagues without being able to throw a 2-2 curveball. You just can't, right? So that's uh, that's my, my spiel, I think, for today about the mental side of pitching. Just be aware. If you're a pitcher and there's a big dif- disconnect between your bullpen command and your game command, there's something up here. And for parents, if you see that same thing or if they go out on the field um, – there's just a mental thing going on. And it's really tough for me to say, oh, like, do this, 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 and this. Yeah. It's just like, isn't that easy? Some kids are really good at uh, just being dumb when they're out there, just getting the ball and, like, competing. And that's the best thing that you can do is just compete. Visualize your spot, focus on your spot, and compete. When you're focused on competing, you don't think about it. Like, think about, think about football. Do you think tacklers ever think about their form in a tackle when they're in the middle of a, of a play? think linebackers think about their form of a tackle no they're so going and they see the guy and they just I'm gonna hit him and they hit him that's how pitching needs to be but there's no really easy clear way to to make that happen all right well that was it for this week of uh dear baseball gods this was episode 44 so if you haven't already be sure to leave me a review on iTunes uh leave me a subscribe on YouTube Snapchat Instagram Twitter uh, there's some good stuff coming out. Make sure you're on my email list. If you're not, jump on my website, danblewitt.com. And uh, I have a bunch of freebies there. My changeup course, my curveball guide uh, for softball players, my uh, 10 softball throwing mistakes, free ebook. There's tons of stuff on there. So be sure to grab one of those, jump on my email list, and then you'll get automatic updates anytime I send out this podcast and, and others and new articles and all that stuff. So All right, we'll see you out there, and we'll see you here next week on Dear Baseball Gods.